Good morning. I'm Larry D'Angelo. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Natala Rachmanina, Dr. Kathy Ferrer, Dr. Donald Marshall, and the other dedicated staff here at Children's National who provide care, support, education, and research opportunities to our children and youth at risk of or infected with human immunodeficiency virus, I welcome you to our annual World AIDS Day Grand Rounds. I want to extend a special word of thanks to our World AIDS Day Committee and to Dr. Richard Kaplan for being the driving forces in bringing our very special guest here to, today to children. Be careful what you ask for. When I heard that Professor uh, Lawrence Augustin, the founding chair, faculty director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global uh, Health Law, had agreed to join us this morning, I jumped at the chance to introduce him. We share so many things. First, we are lifetime members of the Fraternal Order of Larrys, those people who share Larry as a first name. You probably didn't know that existed, did you, Dr. Newman? Second, we were both at Duke together at the same time in the early 1970s. Professor Gostin in the School of Law and me in the School of Medicine. Now, we never met, but I'm sure we shared the same awe over what living in Durham, North Carolina was like in the early 1970s. And finally, as the O'Neill Chair at Georgetown, we shared the distinction of close ties with my cousins, Linda D'Angelo O'Neill and Tim O'Neill, who endowed his chair and the institute that bears his name. Although they couldn't be here with us this morning, they so respect this man that they flew down from New York last night to join us for dinner in honoring him and then flew back at 6 o'clock this morning. So all the stars aligned. I was ready to give this introduction. And then I was struck by the enormity of the career of Lawrence Augustin. Reading his CV is like reading War and Peace, only more interesting. Just some highlights. Summa cum laude graduate of the State University of New York at Brockport, JD from um, Duke University, Fulbright Scholar at Oxford University, and a subsequent extended stay uh, in Great Britain as legal director of the National Association of Mental Health, culminating in the Rosemary uh, Dybridge Memorial Award for the National Consumers Council for a person who most influenced parliament and government to act for the welfare of society at age 32. More education at Oxford, a return to the American, uh, re return to America uh, to be the legislative counselor a Council for Labor and Human Resources Committee under Senator Edward Kennedy, back to Oxford, then to the School of Public Health, and to the American Society for Law, Medicine, and Ethics as Executive Director. By this time, I'm absolutely frantic, and I'm only halfway through his CV. Um, because I know that I can't fail to tell you that he is the author of 44 textbooks, 80 books chapters, a hundred published articles since 2012, including the one in yesterday's uh, JAMA. Uh, and since 2012, there were eight more pages, and I could no longer count. Honorary degrees from the State University of New York, Cardiff University in Wales, the Royal Institute of Public Health, and the University of Sydney, a lifetime member of the National Academy of Medicine, a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and a fellow of the Hastings Center. There's really too much more. But in addition to his role at Georgetown, he is also now the director of the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center on Public Health, Law, and Human Rights. Suffice it to say that Professor Gostin is the most singularly accomplished and acknowledged um, uh, and leading scholar on the topic of health law and social justice that I will ever have the honor of meeting. He is a tireless public health warrior who has changed the face of health justice nationally and internationally, and I am so honored to invite him to give us his talk. 
Global Health Justice, Politics, and Human Rights in the AIDS Pandemic, Getting to Zero. Professor Gus. I want to, I want to take Larry home with me. <laughs> Except he's a smarter Larry, so my wife will figure that out very soon. Thank you so much, Larry. That was uh, that was just so amazing and uh, wonderful, and it's really uh, great to be here uh, at uh, the hospital. You're, it's it's got a, a, a world class reputation, and it's a it's a, it's a wonderful honor for me. Um, and uh, I, in addition to Larry, I also wanted to thank my very dear and old friend Richard Kaplan, who's here, and uh, Dr. Kurt Newman and Mark Bradshaw, uh, Craig Sable, and the HIV uh, team, as well as I'm supposed to uh, welcome and thank those who are in the transom who are listening uh, outside uh, this auditorium. Uh, I am an old warrior of AIDS. I, I, I w have been in it since the very, very beginning of the epidemic, and really what I'm going to do is try to weave a story about uh, an epidemic that uh, has transformed America and transformed the world. And so what I'm going to do <clears throat> this morning is I'm going to first uh, look at AIDS right from the beginning uh, and, and try to uh, give you a sense of what it was like literally at ground zero and what the transformation was like. Then I'm going to look at um, what I see as um, a, such a major and important part of AIDS, which is the human face of AIDS, and how AIDS became transformed from a uniquely socially stigmatized disease to one that the United States and the world embraced like no other epidemic that I will ever know. I'll then move to my own field, which is law, social mobilization, advocacy, and including global governance. Then I'll move to ethics, uh, another field that I, I was very uh, close uh, with. And then I'll conclude uh, this morning by looking at what today's uh, global epidemic is like and what the global plan is um, to get us to, as uh, Hillary Clinton once said, as Secretary of State, um, an AIDS-free generation. So I want to start at one of the very early but not the earliest, but an early international AIDS conference. <clears throat> and I was on a panel um, with the head of UNAIDS and with a highly prominent uh, 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 researcher at Harvard and me. And I had written this nice speech. And I'll tell you why that I ripped the speech up and it's really affected the way I saw AIDS forever. First, um, the head of UNAIDS got up and said, we're announcing a campaign today, getting to zero. Um, zero new infections. And then the Harvard researcher got up and said, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in that article, it's going to say that a person who's uh, under uh, antiretroviral treatment um, is, has a 95% uh, reduction in transmission of the virus to his or her um, partner. And then he said privately, although it's not in the New England Journal, his view of the evidence was that if somebody was truly reliably in treatment, that their viral load was so low that it would be close to 100%. That is, 
treatment as prevention. And when I heard those two things and living through the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, I thought, how is this possible? How could we possibly say that we're going to get to zero? How could we possibly have found treatment as almost a vaccine? If you went back to the beginning, it was inconceivable because this was a retrovirus. Nobody understood it. Um, there was a saying back early in medicine, maybe you'll know, if you know syphilis, you know medicine. And then when HIV came, there was another saying, if you know HIV, you know medicine. And I was just staggered because we had such a complex disease, it was so, so socially stigmatized. And here we were, a prominent scientist and a prominent uh, global health leader, saying that we could end this. Of course, we couldn't end it, and I really, and I knew it then. But I tore up my speech and I asked, how is this possible? What got us to here? And moreover, why have we made these enormous strides with HIV, and we've been so bad at so many other things? I was in mental health, Larry mentioned. I was the legal director of the National Association of Mental Health. I brought cases before the European Court of Human Rights. And what I was struck with was the drugs we have for mental health, you know, sometimes, you know, they, they cause tardive uh, uh, dyskinesia, people shaking. The modern schizophrenia drugs cause obesity, diabetes you know, high risks of, of heart disease. And yet here we had a combination therapy that could reduce people's viral load to near zero and change life expectancy dramatically. And so I want to tell the story of why this happened. Because as I'll say at the end, AIDS changed the world. I have no question about it certainly changed everything in my lifetime. So I'm going to take you um, now to ground zero. Uh, Dr. Mahler, who was a, at the time the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization, was doing a site visit in Africa. And when he was there, he did his usual site visit. And a young American who was actually, before that, the um, a commissioner of health in New Mexico, who was working there for CDC, came up to him and said, Dr. Mahler, I don't know what's going on here, but something is going on and it's really worrying me. The locals call it slim disease. You've got to do something. Now, normally when some, when a doctor goes up to a high global health dignitary, they think they're a little bit of a crazy person. They say, yes, 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 and then they walk away. And Mahler did that. And he went back to Geneva the next day. But then he picked up the phone and he called this young American. And that young American's name was Jonathan Mann. Now, you may be too young to remember Jonathan, um, but he was he is the father of uh, the AIDS revolution, and he's also the father of health and human rights. He died many years ago in the Swiss Air um, disaster, and he's, in, in our field, uh, a legend. Dr. Mahler called um, John and said, um, I, I heard what you told me about slim disease yesterday. I want you to come to Geneva, and I want you to be on a plane tomorrow morning. He then, John got on the plane, and he became the first head of WHO's <laughs> global program on AIDS. It so happened that I was at WHO the day that John arrived. And uh, Seth Fluss, who was then the head of health legislation at WHO, was a friend, said, you know, there's this young American that's just come to see us. And, and you should see him. He's a, he's a nice guy, and he's forming the global program on AIDS. And 
So I said, oh, okay. So I went to see, and it was the whole global program on AIDS at that on that time was John and a Swiss secretary in a lot of boxes. That was it. And um, of course, it it grew to become the the by far the biggest program in the history of the World Health Organization, bigger than polio eradication, bigger than smallpox uh, eradication efforts, um, bigger than anything, bigger than uh, the Alma Ata and Health for All and, and universal health coverage. And so I talked to John and I said, and we became friends and, and he actually then came and joined me at Harvard and we had many, many years of friendship before he died. Um, and so I said to John, well, you know, what's your plan? I mean, what are you going to do? And he says, well, you know, I'm going to just use the normal public health approach. I'm going to, going, going to do, you know, testing, screening, partner notification, anything I do for a sexually transmitted disease. I said, okay, well, that sounds reasonable, John. Um, and I went back to Harvard. And then I came back to Geneva and I said, John, things are really not going well. By this time, uh, AIDS was taking over Africa. It was becoming the biggest threat to the, uh, uh, the African sub-Saharan uh, uh, continent in, in ever, probably. And I said, you know, this, plan, this public health plan is not working, so what are you going to do? So he said, well, I figured it out. And he said, what we need to do is we need to do harm reduction. So we need to get condoms out there. We need to, to do needle exchange, things like that. I said, well, that sounds, harm reduction is good. Um, I know there are a lot of political battles to that, and the political battles even remain today. I'll give you a, a little side story of fast forward to, U, to UNAIDS with Peter Piot as the head. Peter once told me that, that uh, the Pope came out and, and said, don't use condoms, they break. And so Peter went to the Vatican and they had an agreement and Peter described the agreement is, is that, you know, um, you, uh, that, uh, that the Pope won't do science and uh, UNAIDS won't do God. And so, so that, but so it's, it's always been controversial. Anyway, so I left, I went back to Harvard and then, then it continued to ravage Africa started going into Eastern Europe, Russia, a lot of other places where it was, you know, enormously worrying very much uh, in the in injection drug user communities in Eastern Europe. And uh, I said, it's, it's still not working, John. You know, you, do you have another plan? He said, Larry, I've been with you for a long time. You're a human rights lawyer. What I've realized is you can't deal with this epidemic through public health or harm minimization. You have to deal with it through human rights, social mobilization. And he gave the example, which is still very powerful in, in the AIDS world. So you can, you, can, you can inform a woman through health education, you know, not to have unsafe sex. You can give her a condom if she's a sex worker or whatever it might be. But if she's powerless, and women were powerless, particularly in Africa where it was a heterosexual disease, not, not a gay disease as it, as it originated here in the United States, in Europe, Western Europe and Australia. Then, and she, and she had no power over her partner or her husband. If she left, she would have no property, no rights, no, 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 um, no ability to uh, make an income, and it's, it's over. You know, you have to empower people, and that began, began the social mobilization and health and human rights movement that characterized AIDS, and it, and it was a, a, an enormously powerful movement. So then UNA then the, I should just mention this because I think it was important in terms when I get to global, global governance. WHO began, 
became the global program on AIDS, as I say, a com complete force of nature at WHO. And this caused great friction between John, who was the head of UNAIDS, and um, the then uh, uh, new director general um, from um, uh, Japan, who was really thought to be very, you know, cronyistic. And WHO's global program on age and WHO itself began to crumble. And so now, WHO's presence in AIDS is somewhat minimized, although it did do its three by five initiative and so forth. But we began to get new global organizations, and I'll be coming back to those. The global program on AIDS was disbanded. UNAIDS was formed. Then later on, there was the Global Fund um, for AIDS, TB, and malaria. PEPFAR sprung out, and of course, UNITAID. And so you had this major transformation, and also, as I mentioned, treatment is prevention. The 076 trial for, for that uh, began the revolution in reducing uh, perinatal transmission uh, of HIV, um, and of course now PrEP, um, um, pre-exposure pr prophylaxis. Um, so that is how it all began. Uh, UNAIDS then said, no, you're epidemic. Is your epidemic not a single epidemic? Is it one involving uh, injection drug users? Does it involve sex workers? Does it involve children? Does it involve um, gay or heterosexual populations? Does it involve migrants? And that was a really critical part of it. But beyond all the governance and the science, what transformed was law advocacy and the human face of this epidemic. So in terms of the social mobilization, it was a remarkable thing. You know, in, when we used to think of diseases or health problems, and I'm saying this pejoratively, but there was a sense of real truth to it. It was really a middle class, frankly, white, upper middle class, female, charitable instinct that, that where you, know, you would give charity. Um, those of you old enough right, might remember the March of Dimes and, and Jerry Lewis with his telethons with you know, uh, little crippled kids getting up on, on the stage. And that was the way we, we did health advocacy. AIDS changed all that. Interestingly, in terms of AIDS, Ronald Reagan never spoke the word HIV or AIDS until his second term. George Bush, when he was at Kenny Bunkport, when there were protesters, just completely dismissed them, the first George Bush. Ironically, um, his son, George Bush, W. Bush, started the biggest program in the history of global health, which was PEPFAR AIDS, so it was a complete um, transformation. But if you looked at the time, to me, what made the social revolution possible was a complete fluke. It, most times, diseases start either gen as a broad-based uh, um, epidemic um, that hits a lot of social classes, or it hits the lower social classes. In this case, in the United States, um, the UK, Netherlands, um, Sydney, Melbourne, places like that, it hit the gay population. And by and large, these were highly intelligent, upwardly mobile, mostly at that time white um, individuals, and they blew the scientific world away entirely. So there were a couple of things that happened. First of all, I used to be 
an advisor at the CDC, NIH, and really close with them. I'd go to a lot of advisory committee meetings. You would never see an advocate or a consumer there. And all of a sudden with AIDS, ACT UP, Land the Legal Defense Fund, they would be standing there demanding to come into the room. And then when they came into the room, they knew more about HIV than the, than the NIH scientists. Tony Fauci talks about this. They knew more than the CDC. It was remarkable, the intelligence and the work that they did. But more than that, it was in your face activism. They would throw blood at, uh, at politicians. They would accuse them of genocide. They would tie themselves to the White House and, co and rails of Congress. They demanded that NIH transform its research agenda um, to work on AIDS. And over time, that's exactly what happened. So you had this in-your-face advocacy that was completely um, uh, uh, transformative, something that we had never, ever seen. But they were also caring for each other. They started social support networks where people would care for one another in the community. It was a model for how you would deal with the disease, and it didn't come from medicine, it didn't come from science, it didn't come from law, although they used a lot of litigation. And they used a lot of legislation. Now what I think tipped it was the human face of AIDS. There was, remember all the things that happened. There was the names quilt, a quilt that with people's names on it. Then Ryan White, a young poor little kid from Indiana who was thrown out of school and, 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 and made to feel stigmatized. There was the great tennis star, Arthur Ashe. Rock Hudson had AIDS. And then people realized, you know, it was my, mostly men at the time, it was my <laughs> brother, you know, it was my son. And it began to put this human face on AIDS. Now, that really, as I say, changed everything. The United States government reacted in ways that was almost indescribable. As I said, NIH completely changed its agenda. CDC pushed on the AIDS front and became a global organization as well as a national one. As I mentioned, you had these new public-private partnerships that function so much better than UN agencies, um, although some are UN, but very different kinds, UN AIDS, um, the Global Fund. Um, uh, Gavi Alliance came out of this, although it wasn't the AIDS world, and of course, Unitaid, uh, all for this, mostly for this single disease, also malaria and tuberculosis. And then the Millennium Development Goals. Um, put a specific goal on HIV, which was really transformative. The SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals more recently, continues this. The UN General Assembly held its first ever high-level summit on a health issue devoted to AIDS. It came on to high onto the agenda of the G8. Uh, and uh, at the, in the United States, the Defense Department and the CIA declared it a national security threat. So these were things that never happened for diseases and were beginning to happen for this. I think most of it is social advocacy, but you might ask yourself the question, why didn't this happen for other diseases? Now there are complicated reasons for that. I think one is the one I gave, is it's just the circumstance that it, it ha who it happened to hit. You know, in, with mental health, for example, it doesn't have this disproportionate impact on a highly articulate, educated um, uh, uh, class that, that was used to advocating. And we didn't see it really anywhere else. 
The other thing that was magical about AIDS is they just that you could capture the ask in just a single, you know, visual thing. They have a pill that saves their life and we're dying. Completely vivid. Compl anybody can understand that. It's not complex uh, the way it is with uh, so many other areas. But now look around you at health movements just today in the United States or really anywhere. And if you look around, what you'll see um, is people trying to mimic AIDS. Um, so you had the red ribbon. I usually wear a red ribbon for World AIDS Day. It's a fantastic day. Um, but now, isn't it odd? You don't see, you know, telethons or, or that kind of thing. You see marches. You see uh, marathons and runs. And the most remarkable thing we're seeing now is, the, you know, you on Sunday, you turn on your television, and you have these mammoth men with big, fat necks, you know, giving each other horrible concussions. And they're all wearing pink. <laughs> How is that possible? So I think uh, cancer, and I just joined the National Adv uh, Cancer Advisory Board, and particularly breast cancer, is borrowing a leaf from uh, the AIDS movement. There was also a lot of law, uh, not only in the United States, which actually AIDS led to the Americans with Disabilities Act, but in South Africa, the Great Treatment Action Campaign, um, that brought a case um, against uh, the South African government to try to get um, uh, more um, uh, treatment um, for pregnant women to prevent um, HIV-infected uh, uh, infants. Now I want to move on to ethics, because so far what I've tried to describe is a story that is involving an amazing social mobilization and social transformation that I think was remarkable. But AIDS was also an ethical struggle and remains to be today. That is not as clear a picture as the social mobilization side. So if you remember early in the epidemic, there were enormous ethical and policy battles. And these were over a number of things. First, all of the basic public health interventions, HIV screening, named reporting, partner notification, harm reduction and needle exchange, and indeed the 076 trial itself, were all enormously ethically controversial. So for example, uh, informed consent and privacy, and you expect this from Lambda and ACT UP because they, mo many of them were lawyers, focused on rights rather than as, much, as much as health. Informed consent and privacy. You can't test me without my consent, and it had to be private. And so um, there was a big struggle between CDC and the advocates between op, what was called opt-in screening and opt-out screening. Um, the advocates wanted um, opt-in, that is, they wanted informed consent. I only get tested if I want. CDC, and I supported them very strongly, wrote a lot about it and, 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 and pushed them on this, wanted to do a more public health approach. And that's what we have now. If somebody comes into a hospital today, you know, it's routine. To, to do some kind of HIV screening. Um, HIV reporting, don't mention my name. You can have anonymous reporting, but there can't be named reporting. Again, against the public health approach, I pushed CDC toward names. 
now um, we have named HIV. It was always named AIDS reporting, but not named HIV reporting. That was a complex history, why that was, why the community agreed to one but objected to the other. But as a result, what we did is we used to have a picture of an epidemiological picture of the epidemic as it was 10 years earlier, because there was a 10-year timeline between HIV infection and full-blown AIDS. Um, so you had all of these enormous um, uh, uh, ethical concerns. Of course, harm reduction was one. It's still even true today. You know, our incoming vice president, when, when he was governor of Indiana, um, refused to allow uh, needle exchange in the face of enormous outbreak among injection drug users. He finally agreed to it, but when he did agree to it, we had already lost too many lives. And then the 076 protocol, everybody knows that, right, was itself very controversial because 076 was a very um, methodical, frankly, first world intervention. And in Africa, they wanted to give a single uh, treatment to a woman without the entire American protocol. And the then head of, or she, I'm not as sure if Marsha Mar Angel was then the editor of New England Journal, I think she was at the time, she was still editor, um, said that it was, it was like Tuskegee. It was so unethical it, that you could never do that. And um, people like David Satcher, uh, people on the editorial board of the New England Journal, and myself included, just thought that that was ridiculous, that you can't have an American standard um, to prevent a lot of good to prevent uh, HIV-infected newborns in, in lower-income countries. And ultimately, um, uh, that uh, view uh, prevailed, but it was very ethically um, challenging. So I think um, I want to fast forward to a current ethical problem with AIDS that I think really dominates the discussion, the global discussion about AIDS today. And these involve um, AIDS-specific policies and funding, and they also involve the Equal Access Initiative. So one of the remarkable successes of AIDS has also been one of the most remarkable failures. Because what we've done as a global community is we've introduced a siloed approach to global health. It's disease specific. We spend a ton of money, mostly on AIDS, a lot on um, uh, tuberculosis, and somewhat on malaria. Um, but there are, everything else is neglected. Um, if you look at WHO's budget for um, really the, the major burdens of disease, non-communicable diseases, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, injuries, mental health, just a fraction of the budget. Everything else is going to these disease-specific areas. And, you know, and in fact, uh, when I was doing a lot of work with Ebola uh, and even Zika now, um, my friends in the AIDS community would tell me, you know, how can you do that, Larry? How can you, how can you go on television and say, spend that, that time and resource on, on a disease which in its entire time in West Africa, you know, didn't take as many lives as it does every day, every week with AIDS. And I said, I, 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 I didn't like that because first, it's, I was never in favor of AIDS exceptionalism. But secondly, here you have three of the poorest countries in the world, in West Africa, suffering enormously, and the world was turning its back. That was an unconscionable thing. And we, it's unconscionable that we don't 
devote ourselves as, as much to these other problems like NCDs, mental health injuries, as we do to AIDS. And I think people in the AIDS world do understand that. And it is very, very sad to be in a room and have the child maternal health people at odds and hostility with the HIV people. And that's so counterproductive. And so, you know, I think so, for example, Mark Dybul is a very good friend. He used to work for me at the O'Neill Institute. He's actually uh, soon to announce that he's coming back to Georgetown. Um, he's, the, he's the current head of the Global Fund. Um, I think he would change the Global Fund to a Global Fund on Health rather than the Global Fund on AIDS, TB, and Malaria. But he can't do it. And it would, it would be just impossible to do. So what he and uh, the Gavi Alliance and many others have done is they've, they still have disease-specific programs, um, and they're not investing in horizontal programs, which is basically what WHO calls universal health coverage, which is one of the major targets in the sustainable development goals. We're giving almost no funding to universal health coverage and still a lot to HIV AIDS. But there is what I now call, it's not, it's not vertical funding, it's not horizontal, it's really diagonal. So, we're in, so aid money is, going, is being devoted a little bit more and more and more to health systems. And it's really interesting that that's happening. It's not insignificant. It's still a disease-specific issue, but it's, it's very interesting that in the sense that it does have its impact. So why, why was it? Think about Ebola. So I talk about Ebola, and I say, now, why, why did Ebola do so badly in West Africa? And yet, when it went to Nigeria, um, they brought it under control. And the reason was that in Nigeria, they had polio. And the polio approach was repurposed to, to use for, for um, Ebola. We brought Ebola cases in East Africa under control many times, but not in those West African countries. Why? Because we had PEPFAR and the Global Fund very active in those countries, and we didn't in these three West African countries. So it does matter, but it's still horizontal, and it's one of the big continuing ethical struggles in modern global health governance. Here's another one. There's about, I would say, almost every health or humanitarian agency that you can think of, from the Global Fund uh, to WHO to UNICEF um, to all of, to Gavi, all of the big ones, they've joined in what's called the Equal Access initiative. It's a commission. I'm on the commission. And they're dealing with one major issue now. So you have a world where we have, frankly, donors and recipients of, 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 of funding. And in that world, that world is changing because all of these low-income countries are moving to middle and even high-income countries. And so do you, does the Global Fund, for example, or Gavi or UNITED continue to give money to China, Brazil, Russia, India? Shouldn't they be dealing with their own epidemics themselves? In fact, shouldn't they be donors as well? And so these big organizations decided to change their funding scheme, and they got a lot of pushback, again, from civil society. Tons of pushback. And the reason they got the pushback is because if UNAIDS or others pulled back from China or, or India or many of these countries, the people who would suffer most were the marginalized, you know, the LBGT community, um, uh, injection drug users, and the like. And so that continues to be an ongoing ethical struggle. So let me conclude by looking at today's global epidemic and today's global plan. So as we stand here today, 
World AIDS Day. The AIDS pandemic since 1981, since Jonathan Mann's time, has claimed 36 million lives, staggering. And a similar number of persons living with HIV are on the planet living today. Uh, last year, um, there were uh, 1.2 million people um, who died, another 1.8 million people infected. So is the whole idea of getting to zero or an AIDS-free generation still in sight, where I began my talk? Well, the new plan now, of course, is called 90-90-90, and it's called a cascading effect of AIDS care. And so the plan is that by 2020, 90% of the world's population will be tested and know that they're infected. 90% of the known infected will be in treatment. And 90% of those in treatment will successfully suppress their viral load. And it's estimated uh, that if this happened epidemiologically, you'd have a cascading effect with these three big achievements, and you'd get a 72% reduction in HIV AIDS. And if you added um, some other interventions to that, like PrEP, you would, might go higher. And I didn't talk about the ethical dilemmas with PrEP, but I prob probably I should, I would have if I'd had more time. So what would it take to get there? It's, it's really going to be hard, because currently, globally, testing, we only reach about 50% of the actually infected population um, through testing globally. Um, uh, treatment um, is uh, only up for about 50% of those known infected. And the health system itself, uh, this universal health coverage is so unreliable that even for people in treatment, we can't assure, like we can in the United States, that they're going to be suppressing their, um, uh, their uh, uh, viral load enough. So the challenge is great, but we have a pathway to get there. We still have the same social mobilization that we began. But I just want to end by reflecting that the, the changes that AIDS brought, not just to medicine, but to social life. In my view, AIDS changed the world, and the epidemic changed the way we think about health, the way we think about culture, and we think about politics. It's really just a remarkable journey, and we're still on it. And I just want to thank you all, because I know you're really at the forefront of this journey and this fight. And so I salute you. Thank you. Questions for uh, Professor Gott? Yeah. In this era, um, the United States, what implications is the value of the could you repeat that? I, I, in this era, with therapies and things like that, when you give those numbers, are these patients dying of AIDS, with AIDS? What did they die of in the United States? Well, well um, I mean, you, I think other people in the audience would know better than me, but I'll make a first yeah. stab at it, but I'm sure um, you'll know better than me. But it would seem to me that it would be very variable. Some would die with AIDS. In other words, they'd die of old age um, of, of, other, of, of other causes. Um, Others um, will, uh, who are not, who are normally in, in lower socioeconomic classes, um, might not get the treatment. They might die of, you know, an opportunistic infection or something like that, That's, or, or, or some AIDS-related uh, complication. Um, so I think it, it varies very much. And of course, the, the face of AIDS has transformed in the United States remarkably. And that'll be very interesting to see what happens with social mobilization? You know, at, at once this was a was a gay disease, and it was it, it's among the the uh, an, an upper class white society. Now 
very predominantly African-American, Latino, Latina um, uh, disease. And if you look here in Washington, D.C., as a, a really classic example, you see a whole different face of AIDS. And there, you know, we have enormous problems, you know, ensuring that we get the testing, we get the treatment, and the, and the, and the rest. But it's a very good question. I think it's a very variable effect. Yes, please. Well, just that yes. some answer, and thank you very much for sort of excellent uh, presentation and discussion. More, I would say, uh, the uh, mortality in the U.S. has significantly gone down. Uh, what we are seeing is a primary mortality in those who are disengaged from care, and those are dying from AIDS complications, right. actual malnutrition, and opportunistic infections. What we are also seeing very interestingly is an increased mortality in elderly, because despite good virological control, there is still evidence of ongoing inflammatory process and increased malignancy in cardiovascular disease. So actually, if you look today, the causes of morbidity in elder Americans with HIV and AIDS, it's comorbidities that contribute. And we still don't have a very good answer how to leverage, even in light of current antiretroviral therapy, the um, overall maintenance of cardiovascular health and uh, mental health. So probably two big elephants in the room for the mortality question. Thank you. That's right. really helpful. Other questions? Hi, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, my name is Yusuf. I'm a pediatric resident. Um, it was difficult not to see all of the parallels between um, HIV AIDS and the, that um, pandemic and the Zika virus uh, pandemic that's been emerging. We have a congenital Zika program that's been sort of trying to address this. and. The World Health Organization recently sort of down titrated the the importance of Zika, and I know that you had commented on it in the I did, yeah. in that article. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about that anemic response and how that's going to change, and what we can do as an institution? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, W. I mean, we're 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 we're, we're um, I've I've just written another article that's coming out in January that that actually looks at four global health, global transitions in health. About, and one of them, of course, is that we have, we're getting a new um, Director General of WHO. There are six candidates. Four of them are European. Um, my guess is, is that uh, the, the, the French candidate and the British candidate are the two leading ones. Um, the executive board will decide soon. But they have to face an organization that's really crippled, mostly with Ebola. I think they've done a little bit better with Zika, um, but I did criticize them. I thought, and actually Tony Fauci did as well, which is odd for a government official, for down for downgrading. Um, so I had two very very senior officials at WHO. One is actually the head of the their emergency committee on Zika. The other is very, you know very very high up. Both of them called me, um, uh, at, at, uh, and they said, "Well, you know, why, you know, why are you criticizing us?" And I, so I said, "Well, you know, I'm I'm your closest friend. I want WHO to succeed, but friends, you know, they tell the truth, and it was a, an error to do it um, because it sends exactly the wrong signal. In fact, right now we're in the winter months, but it's going into the summer months." In lower income, in Africa, in South Asia, in 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 Latin America, and so I thought it was completely the wrong signal, and and I said and I said so. Of course, the other transitions is we've got uh, Gutierrez, uh, who's a new um, uh, uh, UN Secretary General coming in, who was the head of uh, uh, UN uh, uh, High Commission, who was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. So health was a big issue with him. Uh, Jim Kim, Jim was just reelected to the bank. He's got a, a he was he was in charge of the three by five program at WHO on HIV. So he's got a he's got a health background, and of course now we have Donald Trump, um, and what that's going to do in terms of you know global governance, WHO, the UN itself. So it's a really interesting time, um, uh, but WHO is badly wounded, and they do need to heal. I have a whole different talk on WHO and Zika. <laughs> okay, one more question. Do we have time for? Okay, if not, uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. 
raise uh, the awareness of this country on these issues and that led to um, a lot of societal change of same-sex marriage as an example. Uh, do you think that grew out of kind of the awareness that was raised by the AIDS advocacy, or is that a larger context? Oh, I think, uh, I mean, I, you know, you, you couldn't draw a direct line and say that, you know, if, you know, if not for AIDS, this would never have happened. But I think AIDS was enormously influential in not just the United States, but worldwide same-sex marriage and, and, and LBGT uh, rights community. There's no question about it. And, as a, and a, because I think it just really transformed the way people thought about um, uh, sex and, and, and sexual identity. And as I say, many other areas. I mean, we don't realize, you know, the, 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 the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. These were all due to the AIDS movement. I mean, it really uh, is transformative. And I'll just end with one thing. I think most of us in this room know it, but does the young generation know it? I brought my kids to New York once, and we were, when they were a little bit younger, and we were walking and saw, happened to see an ex exhibit on AIDS, and we walked in, and they saw somebody who was like, you know, what we used to call when I was a kid a Biafran, somebody who was completely starving. You know, and they said, well, what's that? And I said, well, that's slim disease. I mean, that's the wasting syndrome. They didn't know. Then they saw somebody with, you know, um, marks all over their body. You know, what's that, Dad? I said, that's carpacy sarcoma. And, you know, people, the young generation don't understand the transformative effects of AIDS, and it's a particular problem with the young gay male community because they may have similar kinds of behaviors. But yes, it was it com it was completely socially transformative. And I think about the NFL. You know, <laughs> Dr. Newman, you have the last word. <laughs> Well, Professor, I, there's not a Larry. There's not a last word uh, on on this, uh, but uh, certainly we've just heard a wonderful uh, uh, discussion today, and and thank you for bringing that to us. It, as I was sitting here, you mentioned uh, one kind of a, a a reason potentially for optimism, because you mentioned uh, Ronald Reagan, you mentioned uh, President George W. Bush, uh, people. Um, uh, in their careers before they got into the presidency didn't really have a reputation or a record of being passionate about something like HIV and AIDS. And the other one I remember as a pediatric surgeon was the Surgeon General, uh, 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 Coop, who yeah. uh, really, uh, you know, did a total about face, he tremendous did. political courage yeah, to I knew uh, him. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm. bring that uh into the light at a time when uh, uh, others were not doing so. It's a great example. It, it's, uh, you know, I think the, the human face and the uh, uh, keeping and the advocacy, and I think that's a role that, that Children's National needs to continue to play in organizations like ours and, and uh, 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 professors and, and leaders like you to not uh, let that, because, uh, you know, we're all, uh, we're all, human and um, uh, we all I think at the core of what we who we are and what we believe uh, there's that humanitarian urge to do uh, to do better and um, I think on this world uh, AIDS uh, day uh, it's an important time to um, you know share that and and uh, be optimistic and and continue um, continue the great work so thank you for uh, bringing um, that message to us. And thank you for all the wonderful work you do. And thank you all for being here.